Hello, everybody. This is the second meeting on the series of cyclog meetings about large language models. And today we have an intro to some of the practices, mostly front engineering and and uh, vector embeddings, vector databases. It is kind of a preparation for tomorrow's talk about Bosquet. And uh, what we uh, we mostly have is a talk by Ilfan, who is here with us on a very late hour on Ilfan's time zone. And so really thank you so much, Ilfan, for preparing this talk and being able to be here today. And um, I think uh, we'll start by introductions. So anybody is invited to say something, uh, you know, about yourself, about your interests, anything you find relevant. And maybe we will begin with the main speakers. Uh, uh, so maybe, Yufan, would you like to say something about yourself, even though many people already know you? Right. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for having me today. Uh, good evening for me. <laughs> so uh, maybe good afternoon and morning for all of you. Uh, I'm Irfan. Uh, right now, I'm an economics master student in Tokyo in Waseda University. But uh, I, uh, in the last five months, uh, we've been running a pre-launch uh, startup uh, using OpenAI API to help improve small businesses' uh, velocity. So uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, discipline, uh, this prompt engineering. Uh, because in one hand, it's close to programming, but on the other hand, it's also quite close to uh, writing in English. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's uh, it for me, my introduction for today. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and maybe uh, Ziggy Mantas, uh, tomorrow's speaker, would you like to say something? Hey, hi. Yeah, apologies for the um, uh, mess of background. I, my apartment is being renovated, <laughs> so I'm sitting in between the boxes. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm Shigi Mandas. Tomorrow we will, we will be presenting uh, Basket uh, Closure uh, LLM Operations uh, Library. Uh, but it will not be only about, about that. I will try to cover general ecosystem, mainly Python, of course, uh, to get the map of where we are with tooling. And maybe then I want to steer the discussion towards where as a closure community we, we would like to would like to go uh, in terms of Bosque or maybe other, other, other libraries as well. So that's my kind of goal to, to open up this, this discussion and, and see what, where it will get us. Overall, I was working with uh, AI and LP, natural language processing for many years, so over a decade, I was running my kind of agency consultancy in that area. Uh, now working in another AI, AI, AI startup. Yeah, so I'm gonna be in long-term, I have long, long, long lasting interest in this area in, in how language can, can be can be understood by the machines. And yeah, the LLMs are really exciting uh, development in the technology area. So uh, yeah, I'm really happy to, to participate in, in, in those sessions. Yeah, looking forward. Thank you, Daniel, for inviting. Wonderful, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'm Daniel. I am a community organizer at Cyclog, the Cyclog community for data science and closure. And my background is mostly probability and statistics. And today I'll present very briefly some of the ideas of vector embeddings and databases, which I'm, you know, a, a newcomer to this topic, but uh, I'll just demonstrate what, what I learned. And yeah, um, uh, Andres, would you like to say something? Uh, yes, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Daniel, for organizing it and for the speakers. Um, I did a lot of social sciences before, and I moved into software engineering a few years ago. I discovered Clojure two years ago, and now I'm trying to, to find a job so, in Clojure so that I can work and do Clojure uh, at the same time. Um, and I'm... Um, there's so much information about AI and MMLs. Uh, so I just wanted to, when my interest in these talks is kind of to learn more and and, and go through the hype and, and see what, what can be done. And also, uh, since I'm 
kind of by myself, it's, it's really nice to have a, a community and hear people talking about closure and, and get to meet you. So, so thank you for this space. And uh, Elena, would you like to? Hi, I'm Elena. Um, I teach computer science at University of Minnesota in Morris, a small town. Um, and um, I use, I teach some closure. Um, I would like to teach more closure, in particular to the very beginners, um, kind of working my way towards that. Um, also by some sort of happenstance, uh, I've been teaching some machine learning stuff recently and it's been challenging and fun. Uh, so I look forward to the talk and thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, Tori, hello, would you like to say something about yourself? Hello, I am Tori Anderson. I work at BYU um, in the USA, Brigham University, and um, I work with the digital humanities. And in particular, I'm a developer, a web developer here. And so I've had the privilege of using Clojure for about six years or maybe a little longer. And uh, it's been good. I train Clojure employees, student employees. And so that's been great to be able to work with them. At the moment, I am out of students finishing up a big project. So that's what I'm up to right now. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, hello, Ian, would you like to say something? Hello, I'm Clojure developer. Been using Clojure professionally for about four years, I think, uh, playing with it for about 12. Um, I, I'm hoping to get from these meetings, what I'm hoping to get from these meetings is to be a little less confused um, about the whole area of AI, LLMs and so on. I, I don't bring any great expertise to it. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, hello, Kevin, would you like to say something? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm... Uh kind of new to closure. I'm not doing any work with it yet, but I'm hoping to in the future. And um, I have some background with machine learning and I'm just really interested in what's going on with the LLM stuff and seeing how closure is being used for that. Great, thank you. And Dan, hello. Uh, would you like to present yourself? Oh, maybe you're on mute. Uh, so, and if you cannot talk, then then uh, we remember meeting you in the past and wonderful to meet again. And you are also invited to write in the chat. And yeah, so I think we are all here and maybe it makes sense to begin with the Ilfan's talk. Um, yeah, and uh, I think uh, we'll have questions at the end of the talk, but uh, if you have anything that you're wondering about, then you can write it in the chat in the meantime, and then we'll ask you one. Um, Thank you very much, Daniel, for uh, introducing us and the introduction session. So uh, let's begin uh, the first half. Uh, hopefully it's shared now. So uh, uh, I will talk about the basics of Chrome engineering, uh, and I will uh, first, I will talk about the, not theories exactly, but like uh, more like rules of thumbs that uh, people have been uh, developing in the last few months since ChatGPT has been uh, opened up and the API has been opened up. And I will uh, demo uh, some of these uh, techniques later on uh, during the second half of my presentation. Right, uh, right uh, let's go. Uh, yes, I've talked about my background briefly before, but uh, just uh, for, uh, I'm right now a master's student in Washington University in Tokyo, but I'm also working as a back-end engineer slash co-founder in a pre-launch AI startup, Opland, based here. And uh, actually, previously, I was also a project manager for a big data uh, database in the Indonesian Financial Service Authority for a few uh, well, for two years. 
and my major is uh, Python and also dabble with some R as an economics, sorry, as an economist, but uh, I have been hobby coding in uh, Clojure since 2020. Unfortunately, I'm still at UI. So maybe there's a lot of Indian language that I don't actually uh, know yet. But I'm here in the uh, Clojure Slack and also in the Functional Cafe. And feel free to DM me anytime. I will be very uh, happy to talk with you in the AI or in any other topics. Right. So first, uh, let's uh, remind ourselves on the progress in, you know, large language models in the last few years. So uh, as we know, the uh, transformer models are based on a paper called Attention is All You Need, which was released by Google, if I'm not mistaken, in 2016. And two years after that, the first uh, large language models, which uh, is defined as uh, models which is uh, which have uh, multi-millions or billions of uh, parameters in their, uh, you know, I might, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. So this, all of these models are used for NLP, for natural language processing, mainly in English, but also other languages as well. And as you can see in 2019, uh, this is where the first explosion in large language models started from OpenAI GPT-2 and also uh, academy, academy uh, research, researchers uh, releases, Roberta Distilbert, long former, and also from Google T5 and GPT-J. Actually, our startup was using a GPT-J before as an alternative for OpenAI API. Uh, finally, in this year, we see a lot of releases from GPT-4, and then from Meta AI, we have Llama. From Google, we also have right now some uh, pre-launch beta API access for their BART system. And also in the open source space, we have uh, Magic LM, Falcon LM. And the interesting part is uh, most of these prompting techniques work not just with the open AI models, but also the other open source models. Not exactly the same. Uh, most open source models are not able to code well, but most of them, if you ask, uh, you know, if you ask these uh, models uh, to output something, they will try to do so. Yes, right. So uh, for this talk, I will focus on uh, on the available APIs from OpenAI. Uh, I think this is the uh, most major uh, API. Uh, which is available right now. And there are a few choices. Uh, actually, there is also been an update in the, uh, this week with new APIs, but this uh, four is what's been available in the last few months. Uh, there is GPT-4, of course, which is the most advanced model. And, but actually, unfortunately, uh, it's not available for everyone. Only some people can access this API. But GPT 3.5 Turbo is what uh, being used in the free and basic uh, chat GPT. And it's available for uh, anyone that registered to OpenAI immediately. And it's the cheapest. The cost is uh, one tenth of the previous versions. But uh, the important part here is not just the capability of the model, but also the tokens that we can use in the prompts. Um, this API costs, uh, they are a combination of the uh, tokens in the prompt that we send to the API and also the message that we receive. Uh, I will tell about uh, this more in the demo, but basically most of these techniques, uh, we are trying to compress the size of the prompts and the size of the responses in order to make uh, the cost easier uh, to handle for all of us. Right. Next, uh, first, uh, let's talk more about safety and alignment first. The, this is a tweet from last year when GBT3 was first released. And yes, even until now, there are, there are still a many techniques to bypass the safety filter in the uh, LLMs, uh, mostly, right, so for OpenAI itself, there is actually a safety 
a model for filter running in parallel of the LLM themselves. And this uh, safety filter is there both in the ChatGPT website and also in the API. And you know, if you hit too much of the safety filter, then the API access may be cut off. So that's just a reminder for anyone trying to product, productize uh, open uh, chat GPT. We need to make sure that uh, all the prompts that we send to them, including the ones uh, sent by our users, should not uh, hit the safety filter too much. But even when we have done everything, there is still potential, even high potential for end users to bypass uh, our filters. So that's also there to think about. And also hallucinations, I will tell, uh, I will talk about that more in the upcoming slides. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, there's a difference between ChatGPT uh, website and the API. The API calls themselves are stateless. So in order to write, mix, uh, for example, a chat app, then you need to inject or append the history for uh, of your user's chat into the prompt. So the longer it goes, uh, if you want the uh, AI or your service to be able to respond according to the previous user's uh, interactions or chat, it will cost more because the prompts and there is a maximum uh, amount of token. Uh, I think we talked about tokenization uh, last week, uh, but just a reminder, tokenization is a process of uh, translating between human language words from English or other languages into uh, tokens or sets of numbers that the uh, LLMs uh, think about. And it's not one by one. If I'm not mistaken, uh, for English, it's around 30% more than the words themselves uh, in average. So if I have a 1,000 word uh, essay that I want to put into uh, ChatGPT, then it will take around uh, 1,300 tokens. So uh, as a result of this, the if you want to append everything to the user, it's impossible to do more than four or five series of messages. In the open source space and in some other spaces, if I'm not mistaken, Carver AI is using a method where they extract keywords and key events from the chats themselves and put that in a long-term uh, memory in the prompt themselves to avoid this issue. And there's also in the open source space, I'm not, uh, I think we can also fine tune uh, open AI models, but it's, uh, I haven't read anything in there yet, but in the open source space for Lama's model, some of these guys, they are fine tuning or using LoRa uh, to make sure that the AI or LLM stay uh, responding in the format that they've chosen from the start. And after that, uh, for us, uh, uh, sorry, for programming purposes, it might be interesting to tell GPT 3.5 or GPT 4 to output JSON, YAML, or EDN uh, format directly, it's possible. But unfortunately, it's not there every time. Even when temperature is zero, there is still some stochastic responses from the LLM themselves. And this is still not solvable uh, from what I've known. So in closure, we have a uh, spec and schema. So it might be possible to uh, spec every responses from the API. And if it fails the contract, then we can just try again until it's done. Of course, the trade-off is uh, increased latency and cost, but that allows you to use this uh, LLM as a synthetic data generator in real time. And also for hallucination, uh, let's define hallucination as, uh, it's not really fake uh, news, but more like uh, the AI themselves, they don't know which ones are facts, which ones are false uh, 
info or uh, you know inaccurate uh, information the ai doesn't know because they don't have any knowledge about the real state of the world so what happens is uh if the ai is confused if the probability of the next words uh or next tokens as a response to our questions is not dominated by one or two answers but but by many answers then it will go off the rails it will try to answer us but it doesn't know how to so it will invent new books new references and if you're using a chat gpt for research or for summarizing uh, concepts like uh, some of us are doing in uh, yeah in uh, i've heard some students are doing that even in japan this might be a very uh, common thing that you see and this is also happening if you're using chat gpt to answer for example users question or consumers questions for now uh, i have a trick oh sorry i have a rule of the thumb that you can use uh, these three party responses uh, this is credited to i've uh, sorry i forgot the name but it was shared in twitter last march so there's a lot of these rule of thumbs and if you find anything interesting you should uh, try it in chat gpt themselves to see if it works or not uh, I will showcase about this uh, later. And finally, uh, this is the most interesting topic, logical reasoning. So these LLMs right now, there are some methods that you can use to uh, ask them to reason step by step. Some of them are called a tree of toe. Some other is called, I think it's just called step-by-step -step thinking. And this is used by Langchain or AutoGPT in order to see the next steps, automatically run it. Uh, I think we can see that uh, tomorrow as well, but I just had some ideas. I'm not uh, an adept or very well first in Clojure yet, but in Clojure ecosystem, we have lots of uh, libraries and extensions to the languages, including core logic, evolutionary algorithms. So it might make sense in order to uh, combine them with the responses that we get from these LLMs. And maybe for OpenAI, it doesn't make sense because each hit costs a lot, but local models are runnable soon enough in our computers and it might make well uh, might make sense tomorrow. Sorry, in the near future. And yeah, in our experience, uh, GPT three point five is not as good as GPT four, but it can act great in a hybrid system. For example, if you have a Slack bot where it hits your database of a journal of your next task or your uh, di di diary. Actually, this is a possible uh, out of the box in LogSec. And you can use this as, a, you can use GPT 3.5 as like an assistant for you to write or summarize, do the NLP tasks, uh, classic NLP tasks that, yeah. And finally, uh, sorry, not finally, but for a few short learning, uh, I think it's, uh, one of the main unique interesting thing about LLMs is that you don't need to show a lot of examples for these new uh, models in order to answer your question and follow your instructions. But sometimes uh, it might be easier to give examples to the LLMs on what you want to do. For example, in the right uh, side, you can see and on the top, there is a resources tab and I put an EDN format uh, of my current talk. And then uh, I, I, I asked him to generate one for tomorrow's uh, presentation by Ziggy Mantas. And yes, as you can see, GPT 3.5 can do that perfectly. This is the uh, one-shot learning and 
if it doesn't work, you can add more examples until it works. That's yeah, that's the current uh, state of the art, I believe, for uh, programming with LLMs. Uh, this one, I'm using a LogSec plugin, GPT-3 OpenAI by Bcenter in LogSec, which is a Obsidian-like notes app uh, written in Clojure. Right. Okay. Uh, in this slide, uh, I have a list of classical NLP problems, sentiment analysis, machine translation, name entity recognition, topic modeling, etc. cetera. Uh, from all of these, uh, there are two that I think cannot be done using OpenAI API because they will fail the filter. The first one is toxicity classification. Uh, unfortunately, if you send a toxic message to the API, uh, it will hit the safety filter. So you cannot do that. And for spam detection, uh, I'm not sure, but some many spams, especially if you were running an open email server, many of them are talking about uh, unplatable topics, basically. And those are also going to hit the open air filters. But other than that, uh, most of these, uh, most of the other problems, you can do that in GPT 3.5. I will show that as well. Yes, so to solve those tasks, usually, uh, you know, we have a hugging face. I was, uh, I was using a lot of hugging face resources in the last two years. Before the, you need to train your own model on your data set in order to make uh, it accurate on your problem. But right now using GPT 3.5 and GPT 4, you can use uh, zero shot learning or a few shot learning in order to solve this, even with large amounts of data. For example, essays in economics or uh, books, you can put that and summarize that, extract that as long as it's not filtered. And of course, there is this stochastic responses. So the response might not be exact. If you run it uh, again and again, it will answer differently. So yes, but it's doable now. And for all of the modern capabilities that I believe uh, GPT-4 and GPT-3.5 and other computing models, both open source and proprietary, most of them can do code generations. For example, quick scripts. Right now I've been using ChatGPT to generate uh, Babaska codes in order to interact with my uh, Linux system in WSL. And it's also, uh, you know, ChatGPT is also good for using stable and popular libraries. For example, uh, Reagan, if I'm mistaken, it's quite good in writing that. But if it's your own code base, it's a bit hard unless proper context is given in the prompts. And there's also privacy issues. Uh, all the data that you send to OpenAI right now, uh, they have this agreement, key uh, terms and agreement that they can use your data for further training. So if it's uh, your IP or your intellectual property, it might not be too good to send them directly to OpenAI, even through API. And second is informational agent, Langchain, AutoGPT, these are very uh, famous and hype uh, libraries in the Python uh, space. But also, uh, if you guys uh, are aware, there was a experiment by Microsoft using GPT-4 in order to simulate an entire village of 28 artificial humans. And they were able to use basic GPT-4 in order to run a day of this agent. So you can already use these LLMs in order to simulate uh, something that you, you want to see happening. And this is actually very interesting for our social scientists as well. And number three is believable role playing. Uh, there are some commercial offerings here, novel AI and character AI. 
The first one, they use their own uh, text model, but Curve AI is a GPT-4 using model. And there are also a few other uh, corporations that are using uh, this in order to run their customer service if not mistaken. And also, uh, there was an uh, economics paper released last month of a customer service uh, firm using ChatGPT as their uh, employee's assistant, and it improved the productivity by around 37%. Uh, that's by Bridgen, Bridgen, sorry, Bryn Johnson et al. in 2023. There's also right now for GPT-4 and a few models, uh, multimodal capabilities, they can use text and images and sounds at the same time. Uh, right now, it's not open for us yet, but some open source models already have this. You can run them. For example, I believe Gorilla LLM can do that in the Hugging Face ecosystem. And novel capabilities, there might be some capabilities that we don't know yet, but it can be unlocked just by using prompts better prompts, even during uh, using our current models. There might be some interesting things that can happen. Right. So this is an example of a uh, prompt. So uh, this is a constructed language called Interlingua. And I did not tell uh, ChatGPT at all about this language, but it's learned, it learned by itself because it's in Wikipedia. And I will not uh, sorry, I will not uh, focalize this, but yes, they can do this. Uh, making poems in English and other languages, Japanese. In Japan, ChatGPT has been really uh, booming. The governments have been adopting it for their office tasks as well. Right, so I think uh, that's it for my presentation. And uh, we'll move on to the demo version or if anyone wants to ask uh, questions first, uh, feel free, I believe. Uh, right, so uh, let me continue to the demo uh, in Clojure RAPL. So first of all, uh, right, so I've been uh, testing it as well. So for the library, we're using uh, Open AI Clojure uh, API library. Um, I, if fun. Yes. Hi. Um, if you can, maybe it can be helpful to zoom in because I think there are many, many letters and pixels. Yeah. So if you can, then it would be, yeah, that is great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, hopefully uh, it's visible right now. Right. Yes. Thank you very much. So uh, for this uh, demo, I'm using the OpenAI Clojure uh, wrapper by WKO. Uh, it's in uh, GitHub. And my uh, function is just uh, using it to complete the chat using uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo. And for the system, I'm telling it to focus on Clojure language. So hopefully it's able to output good Clojure uh, code right now. Right, so let's do the prompt. Uh, first, my prompt is uh, describe what Clojure is. And let's select this and run it again. So, right. So it's running right now. And hopefully it's uh, not too slow. Ah, yeah. So if you get, yeah, this is the result in the, uh, let's just focus on the RPL. So as you can see, these two are the same uh, input, but they have different answers. The first one is more concise than the second, uh, but I, I believe these are using the Wikipedia definitions. So it's just, if you want to use this for production, then you need to make sure that your UI can handle variable uh, responses. Then uh, let's do the second one. So, this is a bigger uh, 
prompt, but as you can see, uh, I can just use the same uh, function. Right. And yes, uh, if you can see, uh, let me just uh, focalize a little bit. Clojure offers concise syntax, strong functional programming features, and easy parallelization, making it an excellent choice for building scalable and fast web applications. To get started with Clojure, I recommend reading Clojure for the Brave and True. So, you know, the LLM themselves, it completed, it doesn't know what it's saying, but most people, when they uh, recommend Clojure, they use I. So that's, oh, please, Martinez. Uh, hello. I want to add a remark to your previous uh, comment on uh, non-deterministic outputs. I think that uh, I think that uh, in some models you can specify a seed, and then this will probably produce deterministic output. So I'm not sure about the API that you're using, but probably it should support that as well. I don't know. I'm not sure. That's it. Right. Thank you, Martinez. Yes, I believe that's. Uh... In some local LLMs, uh, you can uh, specify that uh, those seeds, like for example, in uh, llama.cpp, I believe you can uh, do that. But unfortunately, in OpenAI uh, API, even when you're using uh, temperature equals zero, there will still some non-deterministic response. Uh, that's uh, what OpenAI themselves say in their documentation. But yes, I thank you very much, Martinez. Right. So uh, this is just an example. So I'm frankly sorry for the large prompts, but as you can see, the first one describe what closure is, and it does. But it just uh, just you know the LLM just outputs very common response that you can see in Wikipedia. But for if you ask it better or you know more specific questions, then it will try to answer as well. Unfortunately, we don't know if the answer is correct or not. That's our main challenge here. Okay, for the third prompt, I want to show an example of hallucination. So uh, again, So uh, for this prompt, it's uh, give me the top three reference papers for understanding GPT 3.5. And uh, for OpenAI themselves, they only trained these models under September 2021. So materials uh, coming from after the date is not in the training uh, data set. So if you ask something like this, yes, this is the result. I'm sorry, but GPT 3.5 is not a widely known or recognized model in the natural language processing community. So if you ask something uh, that's happening after 2021, it will answer like this, or it will just uh, make up facts. So that's uh, one uh, problem uh, with using it in production. Uh, next is, uh, I want to show an example of minimizing these hallucinations by focusing on the uh, old uh, resources that uh, I'm, I'm using the all unit is attention paper uh, from 2016. So it should know about it a little bit. Right. So yeah, it's running. So yeah, as you can see, the uh, response from the API uh, varies widely. Sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's uh, quite slow. Uh, please, uh, Elena. Uh, could we actually copy the entire responses into chat? They're a little longer. Oh, I see. We can look at the entire thing. I see. Uh... Yeah, if that's OK. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the response and I will uh, focalize it. The best way to understand 
keep the tree and transformers as it secures is by reading the paper. All you need is attention is start reading the introductory introduction to gain an understanding of the motivation behind developing the transformer architecture. Focus on sections three and four to understand the workings of the transformer and its attention mechanism. Then read section five to learn about the modifications made to the transformer architecture to develop GPT-3. Finally, read the conclusion to gain an overview of the author's findings and insights. Reasons why reading the introduction provides Yes, so I, I believe this is just a explanation of the previous steps. So yes, uh, I think this is very close to what some uh, professors and TAs uh, recommend in order to properly understand a CS paper. <laughs> so yes. So if you ask it uh, correctly, then it will output this kind of quality response. Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't happen every time. So if you want to uh, use the LLMs in order to help uh, maybe uh, students or new workers, then you might need to run it a few times and choose the best responses. Uh, next, I want to show uh, some example of uh, using uh, a uh, few shot learning or one shot learning in order to solve NLP problems. Uh, right now, I have this uh, email from Nikkei Asia uh, just yesterday. And this is the text. It's quite dense. So let's try to convert it into a summary that we can send uh, in EDN format, of course. Right. So for the problem themselves, it's a uh, purpose, please convert the above paragraph to uh, EDN with the following format. I put this keyword dash one, summary one, keyword two, summary two, etc. to make sure that the model knows that I want it in the specific, mode, uh, specific format and not other formats as well. And I tell it to output EDN only without any accompanying words. So hopefully it does uh, follow that instruction. It doesn't always follow, but sometimes it does. Right, so as you can see, uh, this is the result. Uh, let me uh, clean it a little bit, uh, just so we can see it. Sorry about that. Yes. So as you can see, it doesn't actually follow me. So it doesn't summarize anything. It just uh, changed the email text into EDN. <laughs> so uh, let's try once again, uh, see if we can uh, make this prompt better. Into a summary and then display it as an EDN the following format and let's let's see uh, if it works or not so sometimes uh, just telling it uh, emphasizing a little bit yes yeah it summarizes it but unfortunately it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, show it into different uh, keywords so might be a uh, unit uh, to have uh, more pipelines running. I will not demo that uh, today because of the time limit. Right, so for the last one, I think the most interesting part is the code. So let's uh, look if it can comment some code and also generate some code in Babaska. Right. Uh, first, I have a code uh, for factorial. This is from the official closure docs from the recar function. And it, it does run. So we'll see. Uh, sorry. Right. Okay. So let's see the result here. 
Ah, yes, yes. Now let me run this first and then run it again. And just delete these comments for anyone uh, watching it later. And yes, so this is the result. So I'll just uh, make, uh, make them visible for us in this small window. Right. So I, I asked it to document the, the code and also to guess if it's uh, the algorithm complexity is on or on uh, squared. And this is the result. The code is a function that calculates the factorial of a given number using a loop and recursion, initialize a counter CNT and a counter ACC to one. So I believe uh, anyone with a uh, basic knowledge of closure will say that this result is correct with uh, the code that we give it. Of course, uh, all arms, uh, if you give it more complex set of codes, uh, it, often it doesn't work. So what you want is uh, to refactor your codes, actually in closure, this is uh, more idiomatic as well. Uh, refactor it into small steps of pipelines and then you can use ChatGPT uh, in order to document your uh, functions. Right, uh, last one, let's see if it generates codes or not using the API. So this is just, uh, I want it to gen generate a code that uses uh, calls an external Fun sorry, an external program in Linux, which is a YTDLP in order to download some YouTube video and see if it's, uh, you know, the URL and the video title as well. Uh, one of the, uh, I, I will not see the example right now, but yeah. Yes, so as you can see, uh, it generates the code here. So let's just see if it works or not. So it's going to be this, and then uh, we, we can just uh, delete the spaces. Right. And then, oh, sorry. Just, right. Yes, so as you can see, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what the video uh, it gives out, but the code itself seemed to be working. So uh, I will try to run this uh, later on. But yeah, let, let's just try to run it now, see if it works or not. Yeah, it doesn't work because there is an unsupported character somewhere around there. Uh, yes, we might need to. So you you would want to change this uh, into normal strings in order to use it in your code, right? And replace everything, and then let's run again. Yeah. So, so this is what happens if you use ChatGPT uh, to uh the stuff ah, sorry right and it does work like it let's see yeah i've just uh, executed uh the function that it's given and yeah it's <laughs> it's an it's an error there's an error there but yeah if you want to use ChatGPT to help you code then you uh will I uh, want to dedicate some time in order to test its uh, output and fix uh, some of the enabling issues. But at least for clo basic closure codes, it's uh, working quite decently. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's it for my demo. Uh, uh, I see there are some questions. Oh, yes, thank you, Martinez. Uh, Daniel, I think uh, it's uh, your turn. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Irfan. And 
it is it is brave to to do live demos with something which is non-deterministic where we actually don't know what might happen and and thank you for this it is so enlightening and we now have half an hour till the official time and it means we have some time for questions to Ifan and and to think a little bit about what we saw and then we'll have another small demo about vector embeddings and vector databases and uh, yeah does anybody have any thought or comment or question yeah maybe if I, if, if I can ask uh, then uh, if you wish I think uh, it, it would be wonderful to hear more a bit about your use of the tools and, and practices about if you if it is something you can share uh, in your work uh, what do you think Yes, uh, thank you, Daniel. Actually, I can maybe talk a few bit. Uh, we've been using uh, JetGPT in order to uh, help uh, answer some managerial questions from the small business owners and to, to decrease the hallucinations. Uh, we've been using some uh, graph. Yeah, we're using some database in order to populate the prompts uh, with what uh, we believe is the closest answers to those questions. And from our experience, uh, the answer from the LLMs is quite good in this uh, specific scenario. But of course, uh, we don't believe it's uh, quite wise in order to use uh, LLMs directly for the end users. And you might want to have some filters, some uh, way in order to see what's going on before outputting them in your website or application. And just to make sure that, uh, especially if you're using uh, your own local language model, because most of them are not filtered at all. So it will output some very dangerous attacks. Uh, if even with, you know, with innocent prompts, sometimes this happens. So yes, uh, it just uh, in our case, we can deal with it uh, better because it's uh, mostly managerial questions and it's close to the uh, literature that uh, entrepreneurs and business uh, theorists has been uh, writing about in the last 50 years. But if it's something new or something novel, then it might be harder to use LLMs in this space. So thank you very much, Daniel, for the question. Um, then I have a question about uh, uh, your experience. So you said that it's not a good idea to, for the user to use LLM uh, directly raw. So is it? Do do you think that it's only for input or also for output? Because maybe maybe it is not. Maybe it is dangerous just to to input anything like an SQL injection, but the output is like always could be trusted, or maybe it's both are bad, or maybe you should filter only one of them. All right, thank you, Martinez. Uh, in my opinion, uh, to be honest, it's both. Both the user can, uh, they call it prompt hacking. So they can introduce some prompts that might change the uh, setting of the LLMs if, uh, you are aware uh, this happened to Bing Cat in the first few weeks. Uh, some people managed to hack through Bing and it went into newspapers basically. But also the outputs, uh, some of the outputs, uh, if you're using OpenAI API, uh, this comes for free that they will filter the output for anything too dangerous or bad for your uh, image as a corporation or as an instructor. But sometimes, uh, you know, there might be some uh, outputs themselves that in other contexts is okay or innocent, but in your specific uh, context, it might not be too good. For example, if you're using this as a marketing service, then of course, if you mention uh, something about your competing brand, it's not good for your uh, image at all. So I believe uh, that 
both input and output. Uh, if you want to use LLM in production, then you need to have some kind of filtering and maybe uh, even real time uh, real time choice or uh, by some uh, maybe it's an algorithm themselves or I will prefer it to be human to be honest that's uh, that's going to be hard if you're using it uh, for mass uh, uh, for for many consumers at the same time but if it's uh, a few at the time then you can do it by uh, letting a human see if the output is something good or not. Right. Yeah, thank you so much. That is so enlightening. And, and maybe what we can do now is look into this brief demo of embeddings and vector databases and then come back to, the, to a discussion and maybe ask you a fun more question. And so I, I'll share the screen briefly. And the idea of this presentation is to mostly prepare for tomorrow for the talk uh, about Bosquet, uh, just to have like a more complete context about the practices using large language models. So we'll not explain how everything works, just kind of demonstrate uh, a common practice of uh, using them. And, uh, yeah, and thank you for the friends joining um, uh, and after the, this session ends, we may stay a bit longer and, and share it more. So I'll share the browser now. And if you have any comment or question, please just use your voice because then uh, otherwise can, I cannot hear you. Um, so yeah, or maybe I'll just move a few things around. And, uh, yeah, great. So um we'll talk about embeddings and vector databases and what we wish to do is to demonstrate a very uh, specific practice and the, the idea of this practice is that you know large language models are very good with language but sometimes they need more knowledge and we can somehow provide it to them as if I'm demonstrated as a context to our query, uh, to our queries as part of our prompt. And so what we do is to somehow keep some of our knowledge in something called a vector database. And then we will inject relevant knowledge into specific chats. And um, here is some piece of knowledge, like I, I copied a paragraph from a Wikipedia article about banana. And you see, we have some useful information like the average uh, weight of banana in grams, right? So we want to use that knowledge and help our large language model uh, come up with an answer based on this knowledge. And we'll use open AI, open AI closure by Werner Koch that uh, Irfan mentioned. And you see, I use two of the API functions, one to create embedding, another one to uh, create chat completion. These are two of the many uh, ways we to use the open AI uh, API. And uh, you see, I'm memoizing them so that if I ask the same question many times, I would not need to to actually use the, the API again. So next time we'll be quick and not cost any more money. And uh, here is an example. So here we are calling the chat completion function of the API and we're passing one message and that is how the API works. You see you're specifying roles and, and the content. So here the user role is asking a question about the average rate of a banana fruit, right? And then we are getting an answer, which is not so bad, but it is not based on the knowledge we saw in that Wikipedia article. And our task will be to inject that knowledge so that we can be maybe a bit more precise. And about these role and content uh, part of the, the, you know, of what the chat completion API of OpenAI expects, 
let us actually read in the OpenAI uh, documentation. So here you see the, there is this documentation of GPT models, and you see uh, like a more elaborate example where you have the system role, and then you have the user and assistant roles. So the system role is kind of usually used as the first uh, message, and it's it is kind of setting the context and maybe it is kind of instructing our assistant to to behave in a certain way here it is asked to be helpful right and then we can provide many user and assistant uh, messages to demonstrate a conversation and then the next message to be added by the assistant will be a continuation of this conversation because that is what the large language language model does Right, it kind of completes uh, the check, and if we demonstrate some some uses of user and assistant, then it will kind of learn from this, as Irfan explained earlier. And so I, I found this kind of, kind of conceptually useful, and then there is a nice explanation of these roles by the OpenAI documentation. So here we are very basic; we are just providing a user message, asking a question, getting an answer. Right, and we want to just just a little bit improve that. So here is a variation of that. Now we will add some context. We'll add some knowledge from Wikipedia. And you know, the, this call is conceptually stateless, right? Not exactly stateless because OpenAI might be changing something in the system all the time. But uh, conceptually, uh, whenever we call uh, this, uh, these many calls to the system, they are not kind of sequentially influencing it's each other. So that every time I call this function, I'm expecting to conceptually think about it as a function call. So there is a variation of that. Just the same thing, but first I'm providing some content I copied from Wikipedia. This paragraph we saw earlier. And now I'm getting a different answer, which is actually using the number we learned in the Wikipedia paragraph. So that's the, the practice we wanted to demonstrate, but now we wish to automate that, right? So we see providing context helps. Now the question is how to fetch the relevant content and include that in a conversation in a way that is kind of driven by a user question, right? Because now I was cheating. I, I actually knew what paragraph the user would ask about, but what if the user asked a different question, right? So for that, we may need embeddings. And, and yeah, you see, I'm using one of the OpenAI embedding algorithms. Embeddings are ways to take pieces of text and turn them into vectors of number. And this is not a new practice. It exists for, for years already. Many different embedding algorithms create certain vectors of the different dimensions that are, in a way, representations of our text. And, and, what the, and the property we need for our use of embeddings is that similar texts will get vectors of numbers which are close to each other in, in the Euclidean sense, right? So the numbers will be kind of similar. Uh, and this will allow us to fetch relevant texts through the uh, vector embeddings. But these embeddings have more uh, feature of the usefulness. And, and for example, what happens if you add the embeddings corresponding to given texts? What does it mean that so certain embedding algorithms would somehow uh, work in a way that this addition of embeddings uh, corresponds to adding uh, conceptual aspects of the text. Uh, and that works with much simpler embeddings than, than these ADA002 uh, algorithm we are using now. Uh, briefly, the, the way these things are created is that deep networks are trained to perform certain tasks with the text. These tasks can be 
question answering, machine translation, and so on and so on. And if, and if you take an inter intermediate layer of the network, then typically it will be some useful representation of the input text. And, and maybe one day we spend more time with this and compare a few algorithms, but conceptually all we need now is the idea that we, take, we begin with a text like this Wikipedia article and we receive a vector of numbers and that similar text will get similar vectors of numbers. Any comments so far? Uh, any questions? Uh, is it is it making sense? Oh. Yeah, uh, Martina. Uh, yeah, hello. Hi. I would like to know whether these embeddings are locally stored or stored in the server of the Open AI. So, for example, let's say you create them. And you pro pro probably create them locally, but then you send it. And is it a one-time API call, or is it, uh, or uh, can they be stored, or what is the way? Yeah, thank you. So at the moment, I'm only receiving an answer, not using any API to store it. And yeah, there are cloud services for storing embeddings, and I'm not using any of that at the moment. And specifically about OpenAI, I think they do have something, but I haven't tried it. So now I, it was only like calling a function and receiving this response. Okay, so you take uh, take a paragraph, then get embeddings, and then submit embeddings into OpenAI to get the output. Or, so, or is it uh, everything locally? So in a moment, we will use these embeddings with another tool, which is a certain vector database, but not by OpenAI, a different one. Oh, so I think in the previous slide, you were showing OpenAI stash generate embeddings. I thought it is somehow before even that. Uh, this one? Yeah, this one, OpenAI create embedding. Yeah. So I thought so, that this is related to something that. Yeah, so as far as I know, it is not creating any remote memory, but maybe I'm wrong, actually. Maybe, possibly I'm wrong, uh, but I, I will not be using that. Uh, I think another person has a comment. Uh, yes, I just had a, a question for the embedding that you create, just to see if I understood correctly. The vector, it represents the whole text, or is it a vector per token or per word or? Uh... Yes, thank you. So yes, it is a representation of the whole text. And if our text is too long, which means have, having too many tokens, then we cannot an get an embedding using this call and we will need to split our text into chunks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank so, you, thank you. yeah, so, uh, Honestly, I do not know about OpenAI's uh, uh, capability of, of storing embeddings. And, and in a moment, maybe we will look into the, the docs and learn about it. But anyway, I will not use it, uh, if it makes sense. Yeah, so thank you, Martina and Andres. And now we see we can fetch these embeddings. And uh, just uh, for convenience, I'm kind of looking into this resulting data structure and extracting the actual vector. So I have this convenient function. And so we can just get the vector of numbers. What length does it have? So specifically for the algorithm we use, which is this uh, um, uh, ADA002 algorithm, specifically for that, uh, that is the length, which is 1,536. Uh, and we'll use that length in a moment in, uh, when we are storing these embeddings locally. And now we'll talk about VALD. What is VALD? VALD is a vector database. It is not a new project, right? It has been there for a few years and it is built to be used in uh, very highly scalable situations in the cloud, but we will use it locally. It's very easy to, to run it locally uh, in a Docker container in your machine. And what it does is it allows you, you to store vectors. And then given a new vector, you can ask, 
for vectors which are close to it, which is the main functionality we need for our task of, of fetching knowledge. So given a new text, possibly a user question, we will be able to fetch embeddings of similar vectors and this way find relevant knowledge to be injected to a conversation. And it uses this NGT algorithm, I think neighborhood graph and tree or something like that, which is uh, a, an algorithm for fetching similar vectors, which is itself based on, on a deep neural network. And there is a nice closure client for Vault. It has been there for more than three years already. It is an actively developed project and we will use that. And you see, I'm creating a client, just this uh, setup for accessing my local uh, Vault agent running uh, uh, through this port. Uh, and I'm also, uh, I have configured it to work with vectors of the relevant size, which is the size returned by OpenAI. And the way to use it is that, you know, you can take your Vault client with that we just created and call the, the insert API function where you give an ID and, and pass the vector. And I'm making sure it is a vector just in case I pass another sequential data structure. And, and that's it. And uh, that is how you insert it. So I just wrapped it in a convenience function here. And, um, and you see, uh, if you try to do it twice with the same ID, then Vald will complain that it cannot do that. So to be kind of more careful managing that, I created some local state in my REPL. I'm creating this atom of a map from ID to the vector and never mind about the details, but you know, if I get a new vector to insert to the database, then I'll first check if it is known to me. And also I'll keep the additional knowledge of the context of, you know, how did I get this vector? probably as an embedding of a given text and so on. So all that additional knowledge I can store in a local data structure in my REPL at the moment, just because, you know, it is a toy example. So you see, I can remember, for example, this vector. So this means we will put this vector uh, into uh, the VALD uh, database and we will use this ID and also add additional text to, to the vector as additional context. And then when we, uh, you know, try to search using another Vault API function, then we can take that vector we had above and search for it and say, please give us three results. So you see the first result was the vector itself that we just inserted with the MyID6 but we get other results which are more far away with a bigger distance and this distance is just you know um, uh, sum of squares uh, or root of sum of squares uh, distance of uh, vectors like Euclid euclidean distance of the vectors and you see there are other vectors in the database which are already returned from just because we asked for three results and is it making sense that we can insert vectors and then ask for similar vectors to a given vector we, we have. Right? Let us let us maybe use that with our Wikipedia knowledge, right? So we take our Wikipedia paragraph about bananas, we turn it into embed an embedding vector using the OpenAI uh, service, and then we remember it in our VALD database. And then we can also fetch it. So you see, if we now take our Wikipedia paragraph and again turn it into an embedding vector and search for it in the VAL database, then we get the vector itself back because that is the closest thing we have in our database. And now I didn't ask for three results, I just asked for one. So I got the text with the ID banana one, which is our Wikipedia paragraph. Now, what if we have a user question, like 
uh, the user, oh, sorry, yeah, my, maybe let us again add a convenient uh, a convenience function so that we can get the embedding vector. And then using the ID we receive, we can kind of look into our REPL state and extract additional information, right? So for example, with the Wikipedia paragraph, if we run it through this extract function, then we get the ID from the VAL database, but then look up into our REPL information and remember, oh, that was the paragraph itself, not just the vector embedding. So now it is kind of more um, useful for our need. And then let us apply it to a user question. So the user now asks about, uh, you know, the average weight of a banana fruit. And then what we receive using the pipeline above is that we go to the VAL database and we receive the closest text in the database, which was the Wikipedia uh, paragraph. And then uh, using our internal REPL state, we get the text of that paragraph, which was connected to the ID. And indeed it is this paragraph. So now we can connect all the pieces together. We have a user question. What is the average weight of a banana fruit? We use the VAL database to extract the closest text in the database, which will happen to be the Wikipedia paragraph. And we get the relevant text of that paragraph. And then we create a prompt to the OpenAI chat completion, where we have this context of this Wikipedia paragraph, and then the user question. And here we get the response from the chat completion of OpenAI with the more accurate weight as we hope. So that is a very basic demonstration, just you know, my beginner experience doing that, very basic demonstration of, of using a vector database to store our knowledge and to extract it and use that as context to an open AI conversation. Sorry, I need to go just for a moment. I'll be there in a moment. Um, well, while he is not here, I can ask maybe you, Rufan. Uh, do you think that uh, taking a chunk of text and then, okay, you're back. So do you think that taking a chunk of text and like splitting it or adding uh, multiple, uh, multiple paragraphs of text into one chunk changes the meaning of what it is or or maybe maybe it doesn't have any any influence or what is it even a good idea yeah so that is a programmatic question and from my beginner perspective i do not know enough but yes indeed i'm hearing that is the practice uh, which is you know taking huge pieces of knowledge breaking them into chunks in some way, which is more or less careful, and storing the embeddings of these chunks in a vector database, and then injecting it, you know, extracting, retrieving relevant knowledge and injecting it as context. Or maybe, or maybe it could be like some kind of overlay, like taking half, but a little bit more, but then taking like sliding window or something. Possibly. And again, I'm hearing that they do it, but I haven't tried myself. Yeah. And maybe uh, somebody here may have more knowledgeable comments about that. Um, by the way, we now have uh, three minutes to the official time. Maybe in a moment, we'll try to conclude, ask a few brief questions, and maybe uh, Irfan has more concluding comments. And then some people may wish to stay longer. And thank you, everybody, for being here for very late hours or early hours, uh, many different times. Um, yeah, so maybe it is a time to ask Irfan, you know, if you have more comments, um, or anything else to say before some people may need to say goodbye. Maybe I can uh, add some uh, comments, uh, Daniel. Uh, that incorporates the uh, your presentation. Thank you very much first for your presentation on embeddings. Yes, so uh, I believe that uh, you can combine the from engineering techniques that uh, I've shown you earlier with these embeddings database to make the answer uh, more accurate and closer 
to what you want uh, them to be. Uh, especially, uh, you know, if, if you see uh, so earlier in the prompts, uh, there are some, uh, how do I say this? Uh, you can combine more than one fax at a time. I think that's the main uh, thing that we should uh, be aware of. But the problem is, if you put too much context into the model, uh, the answers uh, might be a bit confusing. Uh, sorry, the model might be confused on uh, what the answer should be. And that way lies hallucination. So I believe, uh, I just want to comment that there is uh, going to be a trade-off between having more specific contacts and generalized contacts uh, because of this hallucination uh, issue. So, uh, yes. Once again, I thank you, uh, Daniel. Yeah, thank you so much. This helps a lot in, in uh, uh, putting things in context. Um, yeah. Um, does anybody have any short comment or question before some people may need to say goodbye? Wonderful. Yeah, so maybe, uh, maybe Chigimantas, maybe you would like to say a few words about tomorrow. Uh, and uh, for those who may wish to arrive tomorrow to your talk. And then maybe Irfan, you may wish to kind of conclude and say something before some people may. Yes, to... just yeah. give me a minute to, to walk to a quieter place because I'm now oh. in the middle of, yeah, just, just a minute. Uh, no rush at all. No rush. We have time. Yeah, so maybe if fun, it is a good time for your uh, concluding remarks uh, for this part of, of the meeting. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, so just uh, for last question, I, I believe uh, in the next few months, we will see more and more uh, models coming out. And right now, a lot of what we find out about from engineering is uh, mostly rules of thumbs and stuff that's being shared around by many uh, people around the world. Uh, I believe that these kind of prompts are usable uh, in many contexts and in many models. But uh, if, uh, you know, if something uh, does not seem right, then I believe you should follow that uh, insight. And if you're using a local model, especially, uh, I would like to uh, just press on this safety concept, right? So, so yes, uh, that's it for me, Daniel. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, and thank you again, your fan, for this amazing talk. And and you know, I think we are all hoping to hear you talking again in the future. And there is more to hear, surely. Um. So uh, in a moment, we'll hear uh, Kimantas about. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Oh, yeah. yeah, so thanks, yeah. thanks for the presentation, both of you, Daniel and Nilfan. Uh, and I will basically continue on what was presented today. Uh, it, my talk will be in two sections. One section will be giving a broader outline of the LLM tooling ecosystem. It will be, no surprise here, mainly mainly Python stuff. But I will not go like into the details, just give a, give, give a taxonomy of what exists out, out there. Uh, with the goal of thinking where where some tooling is lacking, maybe the closure the community can bring in some uh, you know good solutions. Uh, so after that overview, I will uh, present Bosquets, uh, my own attempt to create a LLM ops uh, tool. Uh, I will uh, describe how it can be used to define more intricate prompts with good Selmer. Uh, templating with good path um, uh, kind of a graph processing so we can define how certain kind of bits and pieces of a prompt can, can come up with from different I don't know data points and different prompt libraries and so on uh, and then I will also present how agents are implemented in um, in Basket the first version of it uh, which will also open up a quick discussion about uh, a new release of the functions in OpenAI because now it kind of makes it much, much more easier to implement React uh, prompting patterns. Yes, and with all of that, I would like to kind of close the presentation with a discussion of 
So what now? What what should we do? Especially with the with the Lang tools like like Langchain doing so much work. What's what's the future basically for other toolings and where best to apply apply our work and 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 ideas. So hopefully it will be a great discussion and useful presentation about closure and LLMs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're looking forward to tomorrow. And thank you so much for this. And in a moment, we'll say goodbye to the recording. Maybe we will just say that probably the next meetup will be about the actual transformer algorithms. And our friend Dimid is preparing a talk about that that will hopefully be later this month. And if anybody has any ideas or topics or desired uh, ideas to explore, then uh, let us uh, make that uh, series useful. Oh, yeah, you have something to say. Yeah, so I think, well, LLMs are like so rich uh, in terms of, of uh, like vector databases, semantic uh, stuff, uh, memory, like concepts of memory, agents. It's every it's 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 such a rich uh, rich uh, um area to explore that so if we want there is a, like endless endless topics here for for, for us to discuss yeah. yeah great yeah and we will think together about what would actually help us uh, in whatever we're trying to build and yeah wonderful so let us say goodbye to the recording and then a few of us may stay a little longer after the afterwards and thank you to our listeners and see you on the next times